Welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Muscle Podcast, where we dive deep into some of the most cutting-edge research on human performance. I am Pete Hitzeman, your host and managing editor at BreakingMuscle.com. When you grow up as an undersized kid who's determined to play football, you'd better find an advantage and find it quick or you're going to get destroyed. For David Weck, his stature and a botched elbow surgery were exactly the right set of circumstances to teach him to use his brain to overcome his lack of brawn. David's ability to look at the game from different angles matured into a fascination with biomechanics and movement efficiency. The root of efficiency is balance, and so he invented the BOSU ball to help develop more powerful, efficient athletes. Today, his passion is locomotion, and his work in running mechanics is breaking ground in a field that hasn't made much measurable progress in decades. When the only thing that matters is getting to the finish line first, harnessing the entire human machine is essential for maximum performance. David's work with Cal Poly has led to remarkable breakthroughs in already well-trained athletes, and what we're witnessing now is just the beginning of how he might change the running industry as a whole. Before we dive in, I'd like to thank everybody who's subscribed to the podcast so far. If you like what we're bringing you, take a minute to share the show with your friends and give us a like and a review over on iTunes. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, drop us a line at editorial at breakingmuscle.com. Joining us today on the Breaking Muscle podcast is David Weck. You probably know David as the inventor of the BOSU ball, uh, and more recently he has been putting forth an effort he terms Weck Method, where he's investigating human biomechanics and finding new and innovative ways to train movement patterns that produce stronger, safer, and faster athletes. David, thank you t- for uh, taking the time to join us today. How are you? I'm um, fantastic, Pete. Thank you very much for having me. So. I want to go back to the beginning. So a lot, I mean, a lot of the, the work I've seen you do, you talk about, you kind of jump in midstream. Here's this new thing I want people to try. I want to back up. Who's David Weck, and why are you so interested in looking at things from new and different angles? Well, uh, athletic inadequacy, meaning I couldn't be a professional athlete with what God gave me, was the primary motivating factor to use my brains to enhance my brawn to the maximum capacity. So um, I loved athletics my entire life. When I hit puberty, it was a game of you know, getting bigger, faster, stronger. Football was my passion. And um, I used my brain to be the best football player I could be. And I played Division three college football. I was a defensive back. I was a contributor on the field. Still have uh, at least one record on the books up at Williams College. And in those days, my principal focus in terms of using my head to play better was on the X's and O's of football. And it was really film study that was the number one tool that I used. And so I'm a very intense person, as anybody uh, knows me and can account for, or, you know, can testify to. So I would just dive into hours and hours and hours of film study and logging you know, 20 hours during the week of film study prior to a game, and so it gave me a certain advantage on the field that allowed me to play above my natural athleticism, because I could use my head to put my body in the correct position type of thing. So uh, that is sort of who I am. I'm a little trained who could and will and will die trying, so I'll chew my arm off to, you know, to win. I'll sacrifice my, my body to win, um, so I'm as competitive as anybody else. And since uh, football ended, um, my passion and interest in terms of using my brain to enhance the brawn has been uh, the study of balance measured by locomotion. When you can get to the root essence to improve locomotion at the fundamental level, meaning you've optimized the body's balance, and balance not just don't fall down balance, but balance the timing, the sequencing, the, the where and when of what your body has to do to do it to its max ability, now you have a foundation for everything else. And I'm talking about cycling and swimming and things that you wouldn't think of as related to locomotion. So it was the success of the BOSU ball that I invented in 1999 that I soon after licensed to a company so that I essentially was buying my time that gave me, you know, 30,000 and plus or 30,000 and counting hours to the intensive study of locomotion. So that's the beginning to um, 
now, and I'll say one other thing. I injured my elbow as a 16-year-old. I broke the what's called the olecranon process of the ulna. That's the elbow bone, and it was a, a bad surgery that led to another bad surgery from a complete triceps rupture. And so I essentially didn't have my right arm from 16 on, and wow. that that prevented me from going much further in the upper body lifts. You know, whereas I used to be very strong at the bench press, it eliminated my bench press. So it, I think that little hiccup, it forced me into some other strategies that, you know, otherwise I may have gone down the you know the bigger, faster, stronger path, and not looked for you know, sort of alternative advantage. Yeah, sort of the uh, the external shaping of the path, as it were, um, from being a being a smaller, lighter guy and wanting to play defensive back, and uh, then an injury makes you look at things differently because some of the primary tools that most people use were were sort of unavailable to you for a while. So, one of the things that uh, doing my homework, you've been after this, as you say, you've been after this locomotion thing, researching it and looking at it from different angles for quite a long time. There's there's videos on our YouTube channel going out years and years before, even though from what I've seen, it's only now kind of hitting the mainstream. This is not a thing that you figured out last year, in other words. You've been after this for, for a long time and been looking at it. So what's wrong with locomotion as it's being taught? What are, what are we doing wrong with running? Well, balance is the foundation for efficiency, and efficiency is the only way that you can maximize a particular individual. So if there's inefficiency, a lack of balance, then there's compensation, and that leads to poorer performance than what could be achieved with quote-unquote perfect balance. And so the principal issue with today's conventional running instruction, and I'm talking this is very ubiquitous. I mean, 99 point whatever percentage of the experts teach this idea that you want to run straight so you want your shoulders to stay level and you want your head to stay in the middle and you want to swing your arms 90-90 cheek to cheek and if you do that then you will not be landing every step with your head over your foot or if you are landing with your head over your foot it's very choppy and sort of zigzaggy if you were to do it without side bending and the counter rotation that is associated with side bending. And the irony is that none of the world's elite runners, from distance runners to sprinters and the men and the women, none of them run according to today's conventional instruction. They all land head over foot because they're natural athletes who sense what's fast, so they do what's fast. And like a you know panther moves, he doesn't really think about it so much. It's just what is efficient. And so... What and we can get into some of the specifics of what the spinal engine is and how it relates to this whole thing, but the the problem with today's running instruction is the very first thing is not understood by the authorities and so it's it's uh, coached incorrectly and that leads to training incorrectly or suboptimally because if you don't have the bullseye on the target identified now you're shooting. Even if you hit what you're aiming at, you're off the bullseye. Mm -hmm. And the the unfortunate folks who, you know, aren't athletically intelligent in the same way that the best are, like you know the Division three track athlete, you know they're running exactly as they're taught, and they're all running slower. And the herds and the masses of people who are running marathons, who read Runner's World, and you know, oh, five ways to you know, to train your core for running and you need to brace your core so that you can transmit force and it's the same old pablum like a taking issue of runner's world from whatever year to, to now and it's the same old quite a, I mean it's not intentional but it's complete nonsense because it's just fundamentally not understood and a lot of this stems from the way in which running is viewed and that is from the side primarily where you can't really see the the frontal plane side bending movement and it also stems from the bias toward heavy weightlifting where you know the sagittal strategy of weight 50-50 doing the squat doing the deadlift doing the cleans the things that do make you better but you're not changing your weight from foot to foot and so you don't want lateral deviation 
uh, when you're doing those lifts, and so that leads to sort of this correlative misunderstanding that oh yeah, I you know I want to to be strongest in the core of transmit power from the ball and socket joints. I have to keep it neutral. Well, when you're running, no, you don't. And this misunderstanding is so pervasive that uh, a guy like Michael Johnson, who's one of the best sprinters of all time, when he analyzes Usain Bolt and says that Usain Bolt's technique is flawed because there is this side-to-side -side motion, his shoulders are all over the place, um, the irony on that is that when we look at the footage of Michael Johnson himself from the front setting the world records back then that lasted a long time, he's doing what Bolt did. Now, albeit it's not quite as to the same magnitude, but he's doing the side to side. His shoulders are not level. His head moves side to side. So he's instructing and criticizing this side to side, believing that you have to be straight, and he himself wasn't straight. I mean, it's so upside down. And then the other thing that is a fundamental misunderstanding now that is completely new, is a new paradigm, is what we do with the arms. So the conventional model right now is you swing the arms. And one arm is coming up and forward, and the other arm is coming uh, down and backward. And the idea is you want to, that arm that's coming down and backward, you really want to drop it down. And one of the cues is like, hit the hammer. and You, know, you really want to drive it down. But the up arm is swing it up. And the generalized instruction is 90, 90, that's your elbow, cheek to cheek. And so you want to swing your arms with the elbows essentially 90, 90, without much deviation from that, not toward the midline. And the reality is, is that that's all wrong. It's all wrong. So your elbows don't stay 90, 90. They open up and then they close far greater than the 90-90. And we don't want to swing the arms. We want them to come toward the midline. That's where the muscular alignment is going to take them if you allow it to. And the, the big news is you don't want to swing the arms. And it's nobody's fault that that's the misunderstanding right now. And I'll present a, a theory to you for why I believe we swing the arms today and are instructed to swing the arms. And that is because our most distant ancestors, the, the ones who climbed down from the tree and began this bipedal locomotive strategy, required the assistance of sticks and stones to do it. You need the stick and the stone to hunt the rabbit, and you need the stick and the stone to defend yourself from the wolf or whatever else is you know, going to make you dinner. So the necessity of holding the stick and a stick substantial enough that it can be used effectively, that narrows the, the capacity for what you're even able to do with your arms. So you can't do this pulsing action rather than a swinging action that I teach because the, the stick has attenuated and narrowed the spectrum of what's even possible. So with the stick in your hand, you use the arms to gently swing and counterbalance the action of the legs. And because that's how it started, and for a very long time in human history, it was that restriction, right? So there was a very long time in that sort of hunter-gatherer, you know, primitive, as we would say, uh, culture, so it's passed down from generation to generation to generation, and then as technological advancement happened, like riding a horse or making an axled wheel, the incentive and the need to enhance the efficiency of locomotion just got lower and lower and lower, until I mean, now running is not a necessity. You, you don't need to run. You don't need to walk. I mean, you can, you know, Stephen Hawking can be a very successful contributor to society without ever taking a step. So it's not an essential quality the way it once was. And the irony is now this technological process from the beginning that was always a disincentive to reevaluate the efficiency of running. Like, why do we need to do it better? We already do it well. And then we have all this technology that does, it means we don't even have to run anymore. Uh, but now we've reached the stage where it's so technologically advanced and the prize for winning the race is so great 
that now there's tremendous incentive to enhance the speed and efficiency of running. But the biomechanics of the subject are sort of the red-headed stepchild that gets less attention, less money, less, you know, just brain power. And it's the physiology factor that gets all of the, the attention. And that's the drugs and it's the EPO, you know, the, 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 the steroids and all the stuff, the Ben Johnson, right? You know, there's rumors that Ben Johnson was not the only guy on drugs during that race that he got disqualified. I mean, there's, there's some who had conjectured that essentially everybody, including Carl Lewis, was, you know, joking, right? So, and I don't know one way or the other, but the game has gotten so advanced in the physiological factors, making yourself stronger and more resilient and better endurance through chemistry, that the game in that realm now is essentially cheat without getting caught. I mean, that's essentially where we are. The cat and mouse have got to get ahead of it so that they can't detect it, so I can get the advantage because the prize is so great. And if I don't do it, I won't win anyway. So that's the conundrum that you know the competitive uh, drive leads to. But the biomechanics have just been fundamentally misunderstood. You brought up something really interesting, which is that so much of our study of running has been from the side. And by necessity, because you can't like stand in front of people while they're running at you, you'll get hit. So until until telephoto cameras and you know cameras on rails and things kind of came around, which is somewhat recently, all we ever did was take pictures of people running from the side. So we never really looked at what the spine is doing from the frontal plane, and made a lot of wildly inaccurate uh, conclusions based on one point of view of the runner. The other thing that I thought was really interesting is I, I watch a lot of old track videos, like old Olympic footage and things like that from the 1930s and the 1960s, and there has been definitely a, a change in how people are being taught to run, but all of it has looked weird. Like, there was a time when they didn't want your arms to swing, right? So everybody's arms kind of just stayed here. It was a very, like, puritanical kind of running. Your upper body was very quiet, and your legs do the running, so your upper body just be quiet, and you don't want to waste energy. Well, now that's changed, and upper body mechanics uh, have definitely, over the last 30 or 40 years, gone back the other direction, and now it's swing your arms, but swing your arms in a very regimented fashion, like you're saying, cheek to cheek and 90-90. But that we know that people aren't actually doing that either, because we have these super slow mo cameras now, and we're watching their arms. In some cases, they look like they're flailing, all over, flailing all over the place, right? So, the trick is to learn, as, as you're saying, what the biomechanics are giving us as far as what the optimal pattern is. It, what, what we want to do is we want to make the most of the body's mass. So mm -hmm. mass is going to equal weight, and it's the harnessing the force to and from the ground and you basically have to hit the ground harder to run faster. So it's the stride length and the stride frequency that neither one of those you want to sort of isolate, but rather just hit the ground harder, get off it faster, and that's what takes care of both, the frequency and the length of the stride. So it really is a game of hitting the ground harder. Again, that goes back to the physiology. If I'm stronger, I'm faster. And if you take a 15-year-old you know, and you just did squats, kids going to get faster because they can hit the ground harder. Now, you're at some point that uh, there's a diminishing return there. So, you know, if you chase the weights forever, then, you know, you go beyond the, the usefulness in terms of that strength to use it athletically. And if you're not balanced, which, you know, the, the natural athlete is going to run head over foot, they're going to be harnessing the spinal engine regardless, and they're going to be pulsing the arms to some extent naturally, but it's not conscious and it's not cultivated, so it's not biomechanically optimized, and then it's not trained. And the training that they're doing is not encouraging head over foot, and it's encouraging the swinging of the arms. So you're actually training off target to have your body run on target, and I'm talking about the elite runners, where I learn everything, well not everything, but a lot from the slow motion footage. And I, if I, whenever I work with anybody, I need slow motion footage, otherwise I don't trust the naked eye. I can't, I can't see it, it's too much and I can't go frame by frame. So, the and from the side you see who wins the race and you see the important shin angles and you see all these things from the side that are essential to know, but like you said, from the front is where it really is revealed 
that the side bending and the coiling action of that core is really the generative force that allows you to hit the ground harder because now you're on top of yourself. And that 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 side bending is what it, it's a causal factor biomechanically of this counter rotation. So let's talk about some let, let's run down some terminology because we're we're throwing some phrases out there that probably aren't familiar to a lot of people. So head over foot is kind of self-explanatory. When you have your head aligned over your shoulders, hips down under your foot, your entire you can transmit force along what becomes a straight line from a physics perspective all the way from the head to the foot. So that's a very efficient thing rather than having your head not over your foot, you're off balance, now you're expending energy in not a vertical direction and so it's not a very efficient model from a physics perspective. Coiling core, what does that mean? Okay, so coiling core is basically, it describes this phenomenon that was defined by Serge Grakovetsky and basically the, 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 skeleton, the skeleton is your priority because that's what creates the leverage for everything else. So if the skeleton doesn't have the alignment, if your head's not over your foot, well then, you know, you, you're starting on a, a, a diminished foundation. You cannot be optimized without the head over the foot. Um, so the coiling core is the process from getting from one head over foot to the other side head over the foot while maintaining the, the center of gravity moving in a straight line. And Grakovetsky basically identified that because we have that lumbar lordosis in the spine the way we do, when you side bend in the frontal plane, it biomechanically creates this axial rotation where the shoulder will go down and back and the same side hip will come up and forward. And so in a sense you're getting lift in the hip with an overhand circle. So if you look at both shoulders, they're doing underhand figure eights and the hips are doing overhand figure eights so that you're gaining this advantage to travel further in the air, maintain position on top of yourself so you're not overstriding, you have the lateral stability of head over foot, and then when you hit the ground, you have that alignment, but your body's now coiled to that side, and when you extend and flex to boom, that is magnified by the core action to coil to the other side, that gets your head over your other foot and creates that overhand circle for the hip and so you're, again, you're going further, you're, tra you're traveling further, you're going to hit the ground harder, get off it faster and because of this coiling core there's a central axis where T12 and L1 meet is a central axis that if we take that central spot in the spine and we draw a line out from it, you'll essentially come to where the ninth rib is on the lateral most aspect of the body. So the ninth rib, because the ribs sort of curve down, is where the T12 L1 uh, delineation is if you take it out all the way to the side of the body. So your ninth rib is the axis of rotation about which the shoulder will go down and back and the same side hip will go up and forward. And so if that ninth rib central axis stays the same, now you don't have this side-to-side -side movement, even though you do have side-to-side -side movement above it and underneath it. And so by maintaining that axis of rotation about which you coil, that's the spinal engine, the side bend and axial counter rotation, the center of mass now goes straight as the body and the shoulders and the head are moving lateral, which is cons that's considered to be a fault because the interpretation of it is that, oh no, I'm not running straight. So you, the only way that you can run straight and land head over foot every step is by coiling the core in this manner that is initiated by the side bend. Well, and that's a phenomenon, the, the coiling core phenomenon as you're describing it now is something uh, a lot of years ago that they observed as somebody who had rolling hips when they ran. And for a while that was encouraged and for a while that was discouraged and I think it just kind of fell out of uh, fell out of emphasis for a while. But if you read, you know, descriptions of runners in the 50s and 60s, and oh, so and so had had beautiful rolling hips when they ran, and that was termed to be, you know, a very efficient, um, natural way of running. If somebody if somebody intrinsically had that motion, interesting to know. And I'm I look at it from from a physics perspective. So 
yeah, you have some lateral motion at the top and bottom of the machine, but the center of the mass of the machine is what you're worried about, and it's going forward in a straight line. So that's where your efficiency is, and what the what the periphery does is less important in terms of efficiency, except in that it aids in the efficiency of the center of mass moving forward. Um, and that's yeah. the that's the important caveat because I was about to say you know it, it's cri it's of critical importance that right. because that's the only way you can take the center moving forward and just to get back to the rolling hips comment so the the rolling hip if if your emphasis is on what the pelvis and the hips are supposed to be doing mm -hmm. then you lose that it it really is a top down approach I mean what you're doing with the top portion of the spine is what's really creating what's going to happen beneath. So okay. if you try to if you try to do it with your hips and you turn into some latin dancer, you know, the the, the rolling hip was a natural thing, but it, the problem with cueing it that way and you know trying to teach people to do it well is now you turn into this tango thing where, you know, you're not running well because you don't understand that it is the top. It's the frontal plane flexion is the top coming in the frontal plane. You're not, you're not doing anything with the bottom the bottom is reactionary from the top. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and it, well, and the other thing about this concept, because it's complicated, there's a lot of moving pieces here. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just got to say one thing. It's not complicated anymore. <laughs> it's head over foot, and it's basically shoulder down and back, hip up and forward, keep the central axis the same. Now we've got like a stance of shoulder turn and shoulder tilt that makes it an absolute no-brainer for the athlete and the coach. The other thing that with the, the coiling core concept is to differentiate between coiling and twisting, right? So what a lot of people kind of make the mistake when they're looking at that, oh, why would you want to twist when you run? Well, you're not twisting, like, just isolates two pieces and then twists them at one point. This is coiling. It's like the the, the warped wing concept that the Wright brothers used to, to steer their airplanes, right? The entire plane was was rotating rather than, uh, rather than just twisting at a single point. Can you kind of discuss that difference between rotation and twisting? Absolutely, and that is such an important distinction. So, twisting in our um, method of training with WEC method, it's it's like a bad word, and <laughs> you want to you want to avoid it at all costs. So, yeah. basically, and maybe it stems from this fascination with the transverse plane. Like, oh yeah, rotation happens in the transverse plane, so we have to train the transverse plane, and we have to get very strong with the transverse plane. We don't want to side bend, but we got to get in the transverse plane. And it's all this sort of uh, myopic view of you know the, the transverse plane, right? The problem is it's sort of one-dimensional if you isolate it in that way, whereas rotation in the coily core is three-dimensional. So, and, it, and, and I'm going to get a little bit deep here. I hope the listeners can, can hang with this, okay? So if we look macrocosmic, big picture, history and evolution, the very first animal creatures on this earth side-bended, they wiggled in water to get from here to there. And that mechanical stress led to this, the, the cartilization, whatever cartilage development of a segmented spine that ultimately ossified and then you had fish, okay? from fish who just side bend, it's frontal plane essentially, that's what the fish does. Think of a tuna, it's just side to side mm -hmm. and it's very effective in the medium of water. But then you have the amphibians and the reptiles who come up and their limbs are on the side and to prop yourself up because you're no longer in water, now you have the heart of the spinal engine. because It's initiated by the side bend that positions that other foot forward and then you prop it up and you go and it's this counter rotation in the transverse plane associated with it. And then the mammals propped themselves up and created more vertical potential. You know, took warm-blooded to, to do that. I can't just lay on a rock. I got to, you know, I, there's a cost for that extra power that I'm creating or potential that I'm creating and efficiency that I'm creating to, to do that, and that's the sagittal plane. So it's the same thing in the microcosmic view of locomotion for an individual. It's the frontal plane first that creates the counter rotation in the transverse plane, and that's what powers the sagittal movement. So if, if your shoulder's going down and back and your hip is going up and forward, well, now you have this sagittal movement associated with the frontal and then transverse in combination. So this fascination with the transverse plane confuses the concept of rotation and twisting. That's how I make the distinction. If it's just a focus on transverse, 
you're turning your spine into this pepper mill where you're just grinding it back and forth, right? You're grinding it back and forth because you're not letting it move the way it's supposed to move where it's very healthy to side bend if you allow the counter rotation in the transverse plane. So, and the conundrum of this twisty model is the lumbar spine is not supposed to rotate, but the thoracic spine is. Okay, so where's the dividing line? Like, okay, and so now that led to the complete folly of anti-rotation training, right? You're going to brace yourself, and we're going to take this bow off press, and you know, you're going to hold it close to your chest, and now you're going to extend it out. Oh, my gosh, now the lever's longer. It's so hard to brace against it. Now I'm going to bring it in. I'm going to brace and brace against it. At no time in any athletic whatsoever, athletic event whatsoever, are you bracing and fighting a resistance force. It's all figure eights. You gotta, you gotta give to go, and you gotta boom, boom. And at no time are you perfectly square, neutral, with your hands, palms facing each other, trying to rotate, swing something. The the supination and pronation is a coiling effect in and of itself. So this, this fascination with transverse plane took everybody off track. And these are, the, you know, these are the people who are intense and they read 50 pages down into a forum and you know, they're, you know, that's all they love to do. It's sort of like me. It's what we love to do, right? So, yeah. but now, and, and now they start preaching and they can really preach, you know, <laughs> oh, BOSU balls suck because they're unstable and blah, blah, blah. And you know, you got to brace the core and anti-rotation is the form of rotation training. So you get the entire industry going off course, doing something that is counterproductive to movement because they haven't understood the difference between twisting and rotating. Rotating is the three-dimensional combination, frontal plane first, transverse next, and then sagittal as the result of the frontal and transverse. So that's the, it, you get all three when you rotate and you only get one when you just twist and in the, in the sort of hierarchy of damage to the spine, twisting in the transverse plane is the worst. Then bending in the frontal plane, side bending, without any of the axial counter rotation is the second worst. And then flexion extension in moderate range of motion really isn't bad at all. So it's just the extreme ranges of motion in the sagittal plane of the bend and extend that creates problems. But well, the, the work you've been putting out, I think, is part of a greater reinvestigation of what athletic movement is and how we train people for athletic movement. Because for so many years, as you said, we trained people in this very rigid gym setting, and it's fitness in a phone booth. It's all straight up and down. You will keep both feet planted exactly the same and your toes pointed out at the same angle, and you know you will move straight up and down and keep your core tight and your spine neutral and nothing ever bends. And then we put them on the field. We put these athletes on the field that we've trained exclusively to move straight up and down all the time. And they're put into all of these compromising positions that they aren't physically prepared to handle because they've never trained in those positions before. And they get hurt or they just perform poorly. I mean, we at, at the at the easy end, they perform poorly. At the bad end, they, they get hurt because they don't know how to maneuver their bodies in space when they have to, you know, dive for a catch or throw a punch that doesn't connect right when they thought it was going to, and so you overextend a little further than you thought. Just all kinds of, you know, unusual, unexpected things. So training like yours um, and, and like a lot of other people have started to give a second look at is hugely important to create more powerful, safer, more capable athletes. So when was, specifically with this head over foot thing, was there a light bulb moment or was there a series of light bulb moments? Was there a 40 hour binge study of film that, that kind of created this concept? Let me go back just a moment and talk about the, uh, what you just mentioned with regard to sort of the evolution of the training in terms of you know doing it suboptimally and now moving toward optimal. Okay. Sure. So another point of confusion is the anatomical analysis. So looking at anatomy is simple to see certain truths. So okay, you know the, the internal and external obliques they sort of have this cross sling relationship. So okay, and it's logical that they cross the body. It's a diagonal, and so okay, yes, yes, yes. But 
Now those are trees, right? But there's a whole forest here, okay? And so the most efficient, most effective, simplest, distilled to the essence rotational movement is the focus on one lat at a time because the lat is the fundamental movement muscle of the body. The, the okay. lat is the three-dimensional. It, it, if you get the lat right, the entire body comes along and can be optimized. If you don't get the lat right, it is impossible to be optimized. And if you think about the lat, it has such real estate in terms of its origins there's no other muscle that spans this tremendous range of the body in terms of its origins. Yeah, and let's, let's the, hit that real quick because the, the lat is, a lot of people think, oh, your lat, it's just the muscle you know, behind your armpit. No, dude, it's huge. It covers, like most, it goes all the way down to your lumbar spine, right? Like it's, there's a lot of no, area. No, it, it, it goes all the way down to your pelvis and sacrum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's covering your entire torso and it attaches at a whole bunch of points in between so like you're saying it is a, a hugely crucial muscle that no one pays enough attention to in a traditional strength and conditioning setting well to, to, and to say and, that you're just going to do some pull-ups and you'll have great lats doesn't begin to scratch the surface of what that muscle does right and the confusion of this contralateral function which is all true so you know if I were to cut the internal and external obliques there's going to be problems so, you know, they definitely are on the team and they contribute and they're very important. But that this, this idea that, oh, I'm going to look at the lat and the opposite side glute, right? Well, what about the lat and the same side glute, right? Even though the muscular fibers don't align, that's, that's as important as the lat against the other side glute. And the lat, if you isolate the lat in terms of your training and your target, so that all you care about in terms of the rotation at the fundamental level that's going to make any form of rotation better, just focus on the lat. Just focus on shoulder down and back, same side hip up and forward, about the central axis, which is the ninth rib on the side. If you isolate your training objective to that goal and that goal only as the distilled essence of what you want to optimize, now you open up the door and unlock your your full potential for rotation. Now everything else is going to come and work with Bo Jackson, right? Who do you want carrying the ball? I want the ball in Bo's hands. I don't want it in anybody else's hand. I want it in Bo's hands. The other players are very important. They all have to be there. They all have to fulfill their function. But the lat is Bo Jackson. So it's the greatest muscle. And in terms of the lat, it has a very unique function in that it can contract upon its own origins, but lengthen the insertion. So you can take the origin and contract it, but lengthen and move away the insertion. Now, what other muscle does that? Where we have a portion of it at its origins contracting, but the tendinous insertion is actually moving away from that contraction. And that's how we get the overhand throwing motion, for example, or the punching motion, where how the lat is contributing to that. And we have this very dense, thick, extremely strong fiber that can't contract by itself. It has to react. It's fascia, right? The lumbo-dorsal fascia, or thoracolumbar fascia, whatever you want to call it. That's the origin of the lat. And the lat knits into this fascia where when you focus and concentrate the effort on shoulder down and back, hip up and forward, axis remains the same, now that contraction force of the entirety of the lat all the way down as low as it goes into where it knits into this fascia is now putting this tensile force into the fascia that is starting to develop that fascia Unlike any other way that you can get to it, you can't get as deep and as medial and into that fascia without training the lat according to this coiling core formula that is based on head over foot alignment. And the, you know, the biological explanation would be explained by Grakovetsky. Not only does it enhance your rotational ability, but because you're going so deep into the lat, you also enhance your ability to brace the core. And so when Chris Holder up at Cal Poly is doing, well, he does a 
couple things with every athlete that are WEC method, one of which is compression, that we can do that in another podcast. Mm -hmm. But the rotation in this coiling core, that's something he does with every single athlete with very, very simple distilled exercises that creates what he calls farm boy strength. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, everybody, everybody is squatting more because they're doing this very distilled rotational exercise. They're all running faster because they're doing this very distilled rotational exercise. That's really what makes WEC method training completely unique in terms of the core concentration of this coiling core training. So if we master and optimize one lat at a time, that's the key to optimizing your rotational power and the balance of the rotation, the ratio of side bending and counter rotation to perform head over foot movement locomotion that leads to fastest straight ahead strength, faster agility, multi-directional strength, to, you know, throw a ball faster, hit a ball longer, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when was that light bulb moment? When did you, were you um, looking for something else or did you just kind of happen on this accidentally? I, I've had many sort of aha moments throughout the years that have, you know, led to, um, you know, now you're on a, a higher plateau so that the next enlightened aha you know becomes of greater significance as you sort of tic-tac your way up the mountain. October 2016 is when it crystallized when I said okay now I know with certainty that X on the map is right here like it's coiling core one line at a time Shoulder down and back, same side hip up and forward, central axis is the same. Okay, boom, I know rotation. And so now it was, I have X on the map, which means I'm never going to dig in another spot. I'm digging here, and I'm just going to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper on X on the map. And no one else had identified X on the map. And so it, it becomes paradigm shifting because the other X's are all over the place, and they're not at pay dirt. And this is, you know, a, a mother load that just gets more and more substantial the deeper into it you go. And it's a results rule evaluation. And since locomotion was the fundamental measure that I tied all my work to, we have an empirically objective, I don't care what your ideas are, who cares what's behind it, faster is faster evaluation. Because this training is so distilled, we get this immediate carryover effect that optimizes the body very, very quickly. So no matter what your prior training is, or no matter how high up on the totem pole you are, where the gains become you know, ever scarcer and scarcer, mm -hmm. we introduce this new element, and all of a sudden, boom, you got a boost that you otherwise wouldn't have gotten, and you're on a better trajectory forward for more substantial gains in the future. So there's part of this is an engram neurological enhancement of that precise action of the coily core that now your brain is starting to learn that engram better and better and better. Someone like a Mike Tyson, his brain already knew the engram, so it was already doing it, but even he could get better by concentrating the training according to it. Um, and it was October 2016 when that that light bulb went off and it really did stem from I've always looked at running from the front and sort of you know made observations about like you know analyzing Usain Bolt's start like it's so interesting to me that now all this stuff is coming out on Usain Bolt I was looking at it in 2008 <laughs> 2009 looking at it um, so for me it's like fun to see everybody like you know now looking at it um, but it was the frontal view in October 2016 combined with everything else that I've done for the 30,000 plus hours that was the light bulb that uh, okay and I had read Grakovetsky by that time as well so I had a deep conversant understanding of the fascial integration um, and you know then all the light bulbs and the dots start connecting from the Tai Chi that, you know, from this and from that and the Feldenkrais and the Rolfing and the, you know all that stuff was crystallized to, and, and, and most important, to this distilled simplicity. So we're talking about stuff that's all over the place, but it's, you've got to distill it down to simple, simple, simple. The thing that cracks me up about people 
now jumping all over Usain Bolt's technique is that they waited until he was getting ready to retire <laughs> to start talking about. <laughs> right. I mean, the guy, he didn't well, start running last week. Well, and what's really interesting about it is at first, when people were starting to look at it, it was considered all wrong. Like, oh, no, he's doing these things all wrong. And I was back in 2008 saying, no, he's doing all these things right. That's why a tall guy's getting out of the blocks with the angle and the speed that he is. It's because he's doing these things right. And he hasn't run fast since 2009. Arguably, yeah. I mean, he hasn't set any records. No, no, not arguably. Not arguably. 958. 958. He lost his last race. The winner, Justin Gatlin, ran like a 994. Okay, yeah. 999 nine, nine is much different than 958. Yeah, for sure. And Usain Bolt has not run fast. Since two thousand and nine, right? And yeah. and and I mean, if if I mean, we were projecting that he was going to go into the nine four. Hmm. That's what we were projecting. Now it's interesting to note that his coach Glenn Mills is on record stating that we need to take some of this lateral sway out of Usain Bolt's stride, and if we can if we can reduce that and get rid of that, he's going to go faster. From that perspective. And what's it do to the training? What's it do to the this, the that, the other thing? Because it's a complete misunderstanding. And this is a great coach in terms of like prescribing the, you know, the reps and the sets and the distances. I'm sure he's, you know, one of the best in the world. But from a biomechanical perspective, like all the other experts, he just doesn't know it until now. And that's what's what's really fun for me now is that I'm this weird outlier, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm the guy, I come from the land of 30,000 plus hours of, you know, of free time to do whatever the hell I want, and all I want to do is enhance locomotion. So that's the land that I'm coming from, with no deliverables due. Okay, because if I'm a strength coach, I'm not coming into practice saying, hey guys, I got this theory today, you know, right. stretch the whiteboard, we're going to test this out, right? The, the demands for performance right now are so great that it stifles the innovation. Well, it's like it's like uh, Hollywood now that nobody's made a new movie like in thirty years or something. Everybody's just recycling old stuff because the budgets are so high and the risks of a movie flopping are so high that nobody's willing to take a chance. So it takes somebody with no skin in the game almost and no, nothing to lose because they've already you know it takes some isolation from the market forces, as it were, to try something really new and different. But then you were able to go to a strength and conditioning coach, namely uh, Chris White and Chris Holder, when they were both at Cal Poly, and say, I want to try this thing. Um, and, and both of them, to their credit, are extremely open-minded and eager to adopt uh, new things. They had already been training their athletes in what I think a lot of coaches would call an unorthodox fashion, even though there's nothing really new about how they were training their athletes. They're very big on kettlebells, right? And and Chris, obviously, is a is a doctor of medical qigong so that is very unorthodox but what they were doing is thousands or hundreds of years old but it's just not in fashion and so they are definitely the right kind of people to to adopt some of the things that you've been presenting and seeing incredible results both of them have told me offline and uh in separate conversations unprompted <laughs> that the work they've been doing with you has produced immediate and dramatic results with their athletes who weren't slugs when they walked in the door they, I mean, these are guys, guys and girls who are really, really strong athletes. They happen to be at Kyle Poly, so that means they're also smart. But they're seeing, over the course of weeks, dramatic improvement, even same day dramatic improvement in the case of some of some of the uh, some of the drills that you've taught them. So, what was talk about how you got involved up there at Cal Poly and uh, and what kinds of things you introduced to them? Oh, it's such a great story. It's such a great story. So I was introduced to Coach Holder. Uh, back um, more than 10 years ago when he was at San Jose State, the head strength conditioning coach there. And immediately our affinity for one another went to the East because I was Taiji and you know I was in Chinese medical school and he was Baguazhan and, and he was in the Qigong stuff. So we geeked out on all the meridians and all the energetics and all the you know this and you know all that stuff. So that was our interest, and so very quickly we were just not even on the strength and conditioning conversation because we were both so into this other thing. So that was the basis of our relationship. 
And, you know, we, it wasn't like we were talking all the time, but every single time we touched base, it was always on that subject. And then fast forward to uh, essentially, you know, October, or whatever, 2016, around that time of my, you know, enlightened moment, um, Chris White, who was assistant coach there, who's now at LSU, right, but he was the assistant coach there, and he saw the deadlift that I was doing mm -hmm. online from a video, okay? And what's really cool is Chris White came from the camp of Osu balls are bullshit. So here you go, you have this guy with, you know, a high degree of skepticism for David Weck because he create he's the ringleader, right? You know, he <laughs> created this this bullshit, <laughs> right? This circus toy, right? You know, he 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 created that, but he looked past that and he saw this deadlift, and it's a very unique deadlift where we're doing a trap bar deadlift on the balls of the feet. And we can lift heavier weight. And there's no stress in the spine. And there's no stress in the lower hamstrings. And it's all concentrated in the haunch. And it makes you faster. You can jump higher. You're more agile. And your athletes don't get hurt. What the fuck is David Weck doing? So he <laughs> went up to Holder, right? He, he just from the video, he started doing it. He's athletically intelligent enough, intellectually intelligent enough that he was starting to get it, starting to do it with his athletes, saying, what the fuck? Like, what's going on here? So he goes up to Holder. He's like, Holder, you know Weck. We got to go down and see Weck. So it was really Chris White who was the, you know, the catalyst for coming down to see WEC. So they come down in December, and it was an epic two days. I mean, the minute they walked in the facility here, WEC Method Performance, 7,000 square feet of laboratory for David WEC. <laughs> so they walk in the door, and instantly we're, you know, in the outer reaches of the universe, you know, Holder and myself, and, you know, Chris White can hang with it all, and, we spent two days of like intensive, you know, late into the night, and on their drive back up, they look at each other like, "So, what do we do? Do 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 we do this or do we not do this? Like, or, you know, are we going to do this? We're not going to do this." And they made the decision, "Hey, we're we're going to do it. We're going to go all in and do it." So they had the challenge of implementation with large groups, which is a whole different animal that I don't, you know, I don't have any experience in that. I'm good one on one or small, but fifty kids, what the so. We got the benefit of that experience and their expertise in terms of assimilation, but they started the training, and again, there's immediate carryover to key exercises. The deadlift is not one step removed from the carryover that we're looking for, and they produced these unprecedented results, and it was really fun with the track team because the track coaches don't like the strength coaches. Hmm. So, the, But the strength coaches are very smart. So the strength coaches didn't tell the track coaches what they're doing. They didn't even tell the athletes what they were doing for, we're going to make sure that nobody knows what the hell we're doing. We're working in secret. <laughs> so they start coaching the track athletes with these methods, and all of a sudden everybody's faster. Everybody's throwing for I think they did tell the throwers because there's an affinity between, you know, the, the strength and conditioning guys and the throwers. But the runners didn't tell them a thing. Didn't tell them a thing. And they go to like Mount Sac and there's twenty personal bests in one meet with school records. I mean like wow. twenty twenty personal bests in one track meet. Like when has that, that ever happened, happened before? Yeah. Right? Well these kids have been running, like I said, they weren't slugs when they walked in. These kids have all been running at a high level for a long time. Um, so to set that for everyone to walk into a meet, especially a meet like Mount Sac, and set all those personal bests is really pretty incredible. Something else to touch on, how the training concepts that you're presenting work in with traditional training. So this is not, this is a new training methodology, but it is not a system that excludes other systems. This is something that's meant to make your running, jumping, squatting, deadlifting power movements, all of it better, not a substitute. So are these preparatory drills, the stuff that's on your website and you're on your YouTube channel, which we're going to link to, um, and in the articles that you've had up for us on Breaking Muscle as well, are these warm-up exercises, are these activation exercises, are these standalone, do you do like one WEC method session a week? What do you, what do you prescribe? Okay, so basically, let me back up and give you a little bit of history. You know, I said at the beginning of this uh, conversation that I'm as competitive as anybody else. Okay, mm -hmm. 
So I invent the BOSU ball, and that's you know, sort of good for financial well-being. And millions of people use it, so there's a lot of benefit to it. But my competitive drive to be the best, which I'm not the best at anything, so how the hell do you reconcile you want to be the best, but you're not the best at any anything? There's always somebody who's better than me. So what I said was, I'm going to be the expert in balance. That's what I'm going to be the best at. And I'm going to tie it to locomotion so that it's you can't argue the results. You know, it's not it's not up for debate that I'm the expert in balance. And that was my objective. And it was a very strategic objective because then I could look at somebody and say, I'm not competing against you. I want to help you. I want to I want to give you a foundation that makes everything you do better. So in that vein, I was always working on the foundation, not not the you know the specialization. It was the foundation, the Bosu ball which now I want people to think of it as a resistance training tool, not as an unstable tool. It's a resistance training tool for a very form of, uh, for a very special form of training called compression strength training. And you compress into it with your feet and you compress into it with your hands and it yields when you compress it correctly with the stance and the squeeze and the spine and shin angles, it creates a ref uh, an immediate carryover effect with four things and the fourth being a better squat and it has to do with the unique way in which it, it engages the adductors through the bottom of the feet not from the side and the pressurized elasticity that creates a tension force that has an acceleration factor that's faster than gravity so the more intensely you can compress it the, the higher the tension goes, but it's really the acceleration factor that's special. Because now the nervous system has to respond to something that's far faster than 9.8 meters per second squared. And so now the biggest motor units come to the game and, you know, the fast twitch bike fibers and the stance and compressing through the fourth and fifth metatarsals and the spine and shin angle, it creates this unique result for the adductors and the glutes. And you get off and your feet are lighter, you can lift them up. You're balanced on the balls of your feet. You feel the glutes engaged through the balls of the feet, not through the heels. And then, like I said, the fourth factor is a better squat. So now I have very strong people that were adamantly opposed to the BOSU ball, now have BOSU balls. What's the first thing that Chris White did when he went to LSU from Cal Poly was he ordered a whole set of BOSU elites. That's the new firmer BOSU ball, right? And so he's bringing LSU, that's a very serious program, first thing this strength coach does. And part of the interview process was, look, I'm doing all these new innovative things. I'm doing WEC method. And so first thing he does is he's bring BOSU balls in. And, you know, if it were September of 2016, you, BOSU ball, that's a circus trick, right? Mm -hmm. So it's completely changed the utility of a BOSU ball for everybody. The person who wants to get stronger, the strong person who either didn't care about it or didn't even like it, it can now benefit them in terms of their strength performance. So when you look at pro day, right, Cal Poly, they had a number of athletes doing their pro day for the NFL. That's the most important day in a 22-year-old's life. He's never had a more important day in his life than pro day. That's going to determine the future in a big, big way. You're, you're, there's a fork in the road that is fundamentally different, right? I go to the NFL or I get a job. <laughs> what am I going to do, right? So one of the tests is the bench press. And so they did compression strength training with the BOSU ball to prep and strengthen them for a better bench press. And on the day, in the preparation phase, it's okay, warm up a little bit, get my body moving, compression into the BOSU ball, three reps. Okay, now 275, one rep. Okay, get under the bar, 225, bang, 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 bang. Every single one of them PR'd in the bench press. 25 turned into 27. Right? One wow. turned into five, right? You know, so, and it's because it develops this very unique form of center line strength where the acceleration factor is faster than gravity. And the key is in how you use it. You have to know it in exacting detail, but once you do, it's your best friend. And so for the person who wants to have a better squat, a better snatch, a better clean, a better deadlift, a better bench, right? Those people, and there are many of them, Monday is bench day. So those people, a BOSU ball now as a resistance training tool 
is an integral piece of the puzzle that doesn't hijack the workout. It'll actually cut down your preparation time for a squat immensely because you just get the effect and okay, I don't have to do all these other things. I'm squatting perfect under the bar without doing all these other things. I got a short circuit to it. And then the coiling core exercise is giving you this strapping farm boy strength first to the finish fast effect with that ipsilateral same side then the other side that when you pack it and you brace it it's deeper than it's ever been and that weak link in everybody that lumbo dorsal area you're jacked up top you're jacked below but you got to connect it right where do you got to connect it through the lower back now you have a more fortified connection through the lower back. And the Chris Holder does a whole just presentation to his athletes. He gets on the whiteboard. He says, look, here's your big up. Here's your big low. What do you do with the diamond in the middle? You coil the core, right? Boom, boom, boom. And so now you get that added benefit there. And both of them, because they are the bullseye, it's, it's, it's no fucking around. And the results happen very fast. I can coil your core in less than a minute, and now you're primed to run faster. I can coil your core with a, with a different exercise, but it's the same shoulder down and back, hip up and forward, but now you're throwing a baseball faster. Why do we know? Because we have a speed gun. And so a guy like Steve Cotter, he's a kettlebell expert and a martial artist and a, a dear friend of mine, he coils multiple times a day because now he presses the kettlebell more times. Mm -hmm. And it happens fast. It puts you, it ratchets you up fast. So as a foundational level, WEC method is meant to assist whatever you want to do. I, don't, I, I mean, there's people that want to lift heavy weights, and God bless them, right? There's people who want to snatch the most they possibly can. God bless them. And so you could take aspects of WEC method and make your training better, or you could do the whole damn thing. Come to my facility. You ain't going to do a damn thing other than WEC method. That's all you're doing. You've set your gym up as a lab, right? You're trying to test some very specific things and find very specific outcomes, so it doesn't do you any good as the uh, as the scientist to have a bunch of people in there doing other stuff because then you can't measure to, and be sure that what you're doing is getting the outcome that you're that you're trying to find. One of the, the I think the central underlying thing that I'm finding with with all of your projects that I've seen so far is that it's getting the most out of the system by turning more of it on. In other words, for a long time, we were teaching people to just run with their legs. Well, then we wanted to teach people to just run with their arms. And now you're saying, well, no, turn all of the things on and the thing that connects them in the middle. Likewise, with your comp compression training, we're turning on more of the muscles. We're making sure that you're harnessing every available fiber in your entire body to move that squat by using the, the BOSU Elite to, to get you there in a fast and efficient manner. It's like if you've, if you've got a warehouse and you turn on half the lights, it's not going to be super bright in there. And you're, you're trying to, you've created some systems and some drills to turn on all the lights. And so you're able to get more out of the, the machine instantly, which is really well, useful. Let, let, me, let me comment on that because sure. I think we, we certainly are engaged in this activation, but it's as much about the neural engram as it is about any other factor too. So it's not just taking the lighting system and turning it on full on. Yes, we want every light on, but it's putting those lights in a position that's going to illuminate the warehouse in the best possible manner. So we don't want to waste anything. We want, we want to maximize balance. Balance is coordination. So a violinist, they have perfect balance with what they're doing and the fretting and the, and the bow stroking. That's where their balance is. It's coordination. What we want is that systemic balance optimized to locomotion to provide the best foundation for everything else, and that's an engram. That the engram is basically the you know the the plan or the, the you know the circuitry and the the sequencing, the where and when, the timing, the positioning, all that stuff is the engram. And so when you're able to educate the nervous system such that everything is turned on, but it's turned on according to that superior foundation for locomotion and throwing and swinging. Those are the basic functions. It was locomotion, throwing, and swinging that started the game and still comes back down to that as the foundation. When you have that better understanding of, oh, the adductors, the, 
There's an untapped treasure between your legs that you're not getting because why? You're not shimming, shimmying up trees the way our ancestors did where you had wide hips, narrow feet, driving to the center with the force of the adductors being transmitted through the bottom of the feet. So for eons, we've been squeezing our legs together from the side and we haven't been engaging the adductors through the bottom of the feet. Oh. I get on a BOSU Elite and I set up the stance and the squeeze and the spinal sear angle, all of a sudden the actor, the adductors are being engaged in a way that they actually want to be engaged based on the evolutionary process, but have they've lain dormant for all these eons and now we can get them back to their instant carryover, better squat, you can pull yourself down better with them, you can extend your hips better with them. Right? Adductors, adductors, adductors. It's the adductor magnus is the third biggest muscle in the body. The adductors, think about the adductors. They're not really thigh squeezers. Mm -hmm. When in life do you contract and squeeze the legs together under resistance? Bareback on a horse, you know, jujitsu when you're trying to squeeze somebody into the guard or whatever, right? But when the hell else are you using the adductors to pull the legs together under resistance? You're not doesn't move it around. It's an open chain free. The foot is flying free and it's called flexion. It's not called adduction. It's moving to the center, yes, but it's flexion. And then it's extension. Both open chain and closed chain. Extension. And tell me another muscle group that does both. Flexion and extension of the same joint. Huh? So you have these like magic muscles in the body, the lats and the adductors, that WEC method has figured out how to optimize. We're optimizing the lats and the adductors, and I'll throw the glutes and haunch in there too, unlike anyone else in the world ever has. I'm just going to start calling them my WEC muscles. Those are my WEC muscles. There you go. <laughs> I, I like that. So, so, and here's what's, happen here's what's happening that's really fun, right? Because, again, it's tethered to locomotion, which is objective. So, you there is no, opinions don't count. Faster is faster, thank God, right? Because if, if it's subjective, human beings are going to disagree and they're going to stalemate and you're going to go to your grave not unified in, in, in uh, you know, congruent thinking. Those guys so, are wrong and I'm right. So, so what if you're not trying to run as fast as you can, right? What if okay, you're not great. a sprinter? Perfect question. You want to train the foundation for giving yourself the capacity to run fastest, and who gives a shit if you're running or not? You're still optimizing your core, your lats, your adductors, your glutes, everything, posture, you're stronger, you know, you move better just naturally. So you don't have to want to run. You could be like me and not want to run and train this way to optimize everything else and then get a very unique aesthetic too. My glutes, I got some, I got haunch now. Right? <laughs> I, I used to... I used to have a flat ass, baby, and now because I targeted so effectively, I got a haunch. And but 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 uh, but, but I just want I just want to make one more point, and that there's a better way to run now. Okay, so for yeah. all the people who do care about running, there is a better way. You pulse the arms, you don't swing the arms. It's head over foot. You have to train the coiling core if you want to run better. That's just a fundamental fact now. Because why? Faster is faster. You have to pulse the arms. Why? Because faster is faster. And the distance running strategy with the pulsing arms, what's great about it is it looks completely different than anything you've ever seen before. It looks weird. It looks like, you know, wait a minute, what the hell are you doing? It's the Fosbury flop applied to the universal activity, which is locomotion. And it's faster. It's more efficient. It's more pleasurable. The Fosbury flop, for, for those of our listeners who may not be familiar with track and field history, there was a time when to high jump, you just sort of flipped your legs over the bar. It was very awkward. And there's, because your inseam is only going to be so long, there's a hard ceiling as to how much you can flop your legs over the bar. Then along came this guy named Dick Fosbury, who th threw himself backwards head first over the bar um, and changed everything in track and field. Uh, basically through the whole the whole practice up on its head. Uh, so that's if there ever is a an emblem of a paradigm shift in competitive athletics, it's probably Dick Fosbury. It's um, the greatest it's the greatest example of it, and the advantage it gives you is you don't have to put the center of mass of the body over the bar. 
right. because you're arching, you're arching your back so the center of mass is below the bar that you're clearing it. And yep. that gives you, obviously, an advantage in getting higher, right? So the biomechanics of it are superior, and it's really great, it's really cool, and it's really the way it happens. At first, it was ridiculed. It was, it, even the name Fosbury flop, is a derogatory term. Yeah. You know, it's a oh, pejorative, like, yeah. Flop. It's yeah. a pejorative term that, that became the name of it, right? Because at first, it was so vehemently ridiculed, and then it was opposed. The head of the Olympic training, uh, you know, the coach, said it was wrong, said it was bad, said it was dangerous, said it was a fluke, right? And the following Olympics, four years later, after Dick Fosbury won the gold medal in 1968, the winner won it with the old technique. He's a superior athlete who was better at that technique. Not enough people had trained the Fosbury flop because he had the authorities telling him that it was bullshit. Mm -hmm. And then the next Olympics on, beyond, beyond that, so se you know, 72 and then 70, 76, it was Fosbury. Mm -hmm. 80, it was Fosbury. It'll be Fosbury until we become machines and now we pogo stick or whatever the hell we do. <laughs> but, but until such time, it's Fosbury. And that's what I've done for running. Faster is faster. So if you're competitive, you got to do it. How many millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years, whatever the case may be, how long have we been around? How have we run? And now in 2017, there's a better way to do it? It's hard to wrap your mind around. We've been sort of breaking how people run for a long time. You know, one of the things I found really interesting about reading uh, Bill Bowerman's biography, really fantastic book, um, Bowerman and the Men of Oregon, that none of his shoes like were good <laughs> they were he had like a couple of really early shoes that were that were pretty good and then they just got further and further away from letting people run naturally because they wanted to add more and more shoe all the time and so i think we are com kind of coming back full circle to finding a more uh biomechanically optimized way to uh way to run um and you're at the forefront of that investigation for sure Last question, and then we'll wrap it up because we're, we're running awful long. Um, if Mount Rushmore fell down and they went to David Weck and said, we want a Mount Rushmore of fitness, who are the four faces you put up there? Oh, my gosh. Wow. I mean, with, with that responsibility and you're going to carve it into stone, um, yeah. I just, oh, my God. Um, well, see, my influence comes from people who would be sort of outside of the fitness industry. And sure. I think with fitness, with fitness, most people care about aesthetics. That's what they care about. A tenth of a second, who gives a shit? You know, two, you know, two or three minutes in the marathon, who cares? So my influence comes from like Chang Man Chin, you know, Chinese Tai Chi, and Moshe Feldenkrais, and Ida Rolf, and like these people. So if I'm going to put like the Mount Rushmore stuff. I don't know that Jack LaLanne gets on it because, yes, he motivated a ton of people. It's very rah-rah, but it's more rah-rah than it is educational. And so I, and I, but you have to find the delicate balance. So what I'd want to do is I'd want to, you know, it's not just four faces, right? We're going to, even if we have to make them smaller, we'll throw Jack up there. We'll throw <laughs> Arnold up there. We'll, you know, we'll throw a whole bunch of people up there, but we're going to put Feldenkrais on the goddamn thing, right? My Mount Rushmore would be sort of like a, it would be like a bleachers, and you'd have a lot of people giving everybody their due. I mean, maybe Suzanne Summers is on there, right? I mean, if you got people motivated to get in better health well, and you did it for millions of people, well, then maybe you should have a spot on there. But if you're one of those esoteric ones who helped me understand what the hell I understand and with that significance rolling through to a better way to locomote, well, then you've got to be on Mount Rushmore. It's not four faces on my Rushmore. It's it's a lot of faces, and I'd have to you know, I couldn't even name the people. I'd have to do a little research, you know, to to put those faces on there. We're gonna need a bigger mountain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very cool stuff, David, and uh, I really appreciate you sitting down with me for uh, for this time today. Um, excited to see where your research continues to go, and as more people adopt your systems, how it does for their athletes. Uh, we'll have more content coming from from you and the Wick Method folks up on Breaking Muscle uh, through the coming weeks. They can find you all over the place. Uh, if it says WEC Method, it's you. Your website is WECMethod.com. Your Facebook.com slash WECMethod. You are WEC Method on Instagram. A lot, a lot of really cool content out there so people can find out uh, and visually see um, what we've been talking about for this last hour or so. And let me, let me just say that 
probably the best place to go for seeing what I'd like you to see is a private group on Facebook where everybody's welcome and it's the WEC method inner circle inside the triangle right so that is the place where the cutting edge stuff the stuff that you know if you're really into this and you've listened to this whole podcast then search on Facebook yeah WEC method inner circle inside the triangle I will accept you I want you there I want you training your success is my success and that's where the movement is happening that's where the momentum is already reach the stage where it's unstoppable. There's a better way to run, there's a better way to train, and the best in the world don't have a choice but to do it, and the objective is to help the rest. Every step stronger is the mission. Outstanding. David, thank you for your time. We'll talk again. Thank you, Pete.